Hi everyone, this is Dr. Dave Hansen from Hansen Family Chiropractic. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, tonight we're going to go over the nutrition workshop and we're also going to kick off a 30-day challenge, which I hope you will participate in. This is part of our patient university series that we do at least once a month. And the reason that we do these is the Latin root for the word doctor actually means teacher. And that's something that we take very seriously. So anytime we have the opportunity to impart some knowledge uh, to our community, whether it's patients or just people that want to learn more about their health, we're absolutely going to take, uh, take advantage of that. So thanks for tuning in. Oh, next month, uh, we're going to be doing our workshop on ear infections. Uh, but depending on when you're listening to this, we may be past that. So visit our website at www.hansonfamilychiro.com for a full schedule. All right, so this is all the information I'm going to cover tonight. Uh, it's actually quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to go too fast, but this is probably going to be more information than you can absorb in one sitting. Uh, so I'm going to give you some resources at the end, which will help um, hit things home. I am going to give you everything that you need to make these changes and to improve your health. Um, but what I want you to get from listening to this is the motivation, the, the why you need to make these changes, and the confidence that the recommendations that I'm making are the right ones. Don't worry about remembering all the little sciencey details. Just get the gist of it, get motivated, and uh, start making some changes. All right, so first off, about me. That's me in the bottom right there with along, along with my wife, Kristen. She is the office manager here at Hanson Family Chiropractic. Um, I am the owner and doctor here. Our focus is on kids and family wellness. Um, we treat everybody. We've got uh, patients from uh, just a couple of days old all the way up until their uh, later years and from all kinds of conditions from uh, low back pain to colic, just wellness, uh, behavioral issues, everything across the board. So. Um, but our mission is kids. That's important to both my wife and I. So you might be wondering why on earth is a chiropractor here talking to us about nutrition? It's a good question. Uh, most people associate us with just back and neck pain, but that's really not what chiropractic is about. What it's been about since the very beginning, since 1800s, is about increasing the efficiency of your nervous system. Because the way it works is your brain communicates to your body through the spinal cord and the nerves that come out through your spine right down and through here. These nerves then branch out to and go to your organs, glands, and tissues everywhere in your body. Because the nervous system runs the whole show. It's like their air traffic controller of your body. Every cell in your body is a slave to what the nervous system tells it to do. So as long as there is good lines of communication between your brains and body, everything will function as, as it should. And if everything is functioning as it should, then you're in what chiropractors would call a state of ease. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Things are easy. Your day-to-day -day operations are no big deal. If a stress comes along, you can adapt and deal with it, and it's no problem. So when you're in a state of ease, you are you have good health. You're feeling good. But when you come into some problems is when there's a disturbance in that nervous system. And then the lines of communication between brain and body are no longer clear. It's like having a uh, cell phone conversation where you have a bad connection. Uh, the proper instructions aren't getting through, and then your functioning uh, is not optimal. So when things aren't functioning as well as they should, and you're no longer in a state of ease, you're in what we would call a state of dis-ease. I don't mean that as disease, like you're sick. I just mean that things are no longer easy. And I don't care if you're a person or a car. If uh, your day-to-day -day operations are difficult, then it's just a matter of time before things break down. And when things break down, then you're no longer in a state of good health. You've lost it. Uh, so what I do as a chiropractor is I locate and remove that nerve disturbance so your body can heal and function properly and regain your health. That's, that's chiropractic in a nutshell. So what could cause this nerve disturbance is the, is the obvious question here, and that's what we call the three T's. First one is trauma, which is physical stress, toxins, which is chemical stress, and thoughts, which is emotional stress. We all experience these to some degree in our life, but when they overwhelm our system, then you get uh, this nerve disturbance, and it can really cause some, some significant problems. The one we're going to focus on tonight is toxins, and that's where your diet falls into. A, it's a chemical stress. Um, so you might be thinking, okay, that's great, but how does something that I eat affect my brain and nervous system? That may not make sense. Those people, I always say, well, let's go have a beer and talk about it. Uh, because consuming alcohol is probably the most obvious example of something that you consume as food that affects the way we think and act. So um, the big core philosophies here at Hanson Family Chiropractor is or eat well, move well, think well, and be well adjusted. It's just part of the chiropractic lifestyle, and that absolutely has a huge impact on your health. And the, the, I think the greatest example of that is our kids 
because they're the most sensitive to uh, the stresses that are out there. And unfortunately, they're the ones that are um, taking these stress hits uh, more than anyone else. And, but here's a little graph kind of explaining what I'm talking about. The light blue in the graphs, these are the kids of chiropractors, and the dark blue are the kids of medical doctors. And this is just how often do they have uh, tonsillitis, this is how often do they have ear infections, have to use antibiotics, have to use other medications, and have to be vaccinated. So obviously, the kids that are living the chiropractic lifestyle would be the chiropractic kids, and, and generally speaking, they are in a much healthier place than the kids that are in, stuck in the medical model. So uh, in a nutshell, bring your kids in to see a chiropractor. If not me, then somebody. Uh, contact me, and I will find one in your area. All right, so back to nutrition. This is where I'm coming from uh, as a chiropractor. We're the only doctors that get graduate level training in nutrition. Uh, medical doctors and osteopaths get an elective that they can take if they want. Uh, most don't. And unfortunately, the nutrition that they're taught told about in that is just your your standard food pyramid nonsense, which by the end of tonight, you'll, you'll understand why that is uh, not great advice. Uh, most people have heard of the paleo diet nowadays. Uh, it was the most Googled diet in all of last year, so it's really growing a lot, and there's a ton of great resources out there for it. Um, the recommendations I'm going to be making tonight are, are loosely based on the paleo diet. I say loosely only because some people take it too far. Uh, the basic premise is that if you eat like a quote-unquote caveman, then you're not going to be eating processed foods. You're going to be more of a hunter-gatherer type lifestyle. The reason I say loosely, though, is because some people will say, well, you know, you have to hunt all your food with the bow and arrow, and they start getting a little crazy with it. So um, I'm more concerned with health than I am history. So uh, that's what um, where I'm coming from with this. And the recommendations I'm, based, uh, I'm making are based on three things. One is publish, published research because it's important that you can prove what you're saying. But it's not everything, because for every paper that I present on saying this food is good or bad, I'm sure you could come back with another paper that says the opposite. So research isn't everything, but it is important. Second part of this is the clinical experience. I've led tons of people through these nutritional recommendations and through the 30-day challenge, along with great results. Uh, my favorite is a young woman who uh, looked from outward uh, to be just the picture of health, but uh, she was having trouble getting pregnant. And she had kind of exhausted her options, was going to go through in vitro fertilization, but couldn't really afford it and didn't really want to do that. So all we did was make some nutritional changes to her. And just a couple of months later, she was able to conceive her first child. And they have a, a lovely little one now. So that was pretty cool. Um, but also, self-experimentation is a big part of this. I've tried a number of different ways of eating. And um, the way that I'm out going to outline for you tonight has been by far the most successful. And the most sustainable, because if you're able to stick with something for a couple of months and lose a little bit of weight or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, but then you fall off the wagon, then what was the point? If, if, you, if this is something that you can do for life, then uh, there's no point in uh, pursuing it. So um, I've tried all these and um, feel really good about what I'm going to be recommending to you today. One of the best things terrorists could do is just build more fast food restaurants, maybe add another pharmaceutical company, have a couple more infomercials, and encourage people to eat the way they eat now. And everybody's going to be dead in 100 years. They can just walk right in, don't have to do a thing. One quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and three quarters of what you eat keeps your doctor alive. I used to get high for a living. Cancer rates going up, heart disease going up, stroke going up. We're poisoning ourselves with highly processed, nutrient depleted foods. One of the major problems is what we do to the soil and the air and the water and everything we take in our food. We, for whatever reason, decided we're going to spray everything with every kind of pesticide, herbicide, larvicide, fungicide. We decided we're going to genetically modify things we don't know anything about. Can we actually improve what has already been created? And the answer is maybe, but not the way we've been doing it. If you want to know what's wrong, look down at the table. It's staring back at you. Think of it as chronic malnutrition, because that's what's going on. But if we think we're going to go to the doctor and get a pill for everything, we've missed the whole point. We have been taught our whole lives to be consumers of modern medicine, which is pharmaceutical medicine. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Now, the drug industry has every right to make money, no question about that at all. 
the ethics, I think, need to be very closely watched. What the pharmaceutical companies are doing may not necessarily be in the interest of our population. You can be as sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. Approximately 106,000 Americans die from pharmaceutical drugs each year. And these are people who took the medication as directed. There is a lot more turning to alternatives because what's being done before you doesn't work. There is no magic bullet, but there is a lifestyle change that reverses serious chronic disease. It's cheap, it's simple, it's safe, it's effective. The solutions are here. They've always been here. Every single person in the world, every culture, every language, every person in the world knows it. You are what you eat. Food does matter. It's a choice. You don't have to be sick. I love that movie. It's one of my favorites. It always gets people fired up. Check it out on Netflix. Okay, so good food standards. I'm a big fan of making things very black and white. Uh, so every all the foods that we're going to go over tonight um, are either going to make you more healthy or less healthy. There's going to be no neutral foods. There's no food Switzerland. And the criteria that I look at to see if a food is going to make you more or less healthy are these four things right here. Number one, we want a healthy psychological response. So how is it interacting with your brain? Promote a healthy hormonal response, which is huge, especially if you're trying to lose weight. Um, number three is support a healthy gut. And number four is support your immune function and minimize inflammation, which is a huge problem nowadays. So let's break these down real quick. Number one, your brain on food. So I'm going to tell you something you probably already know. Dieting doesn't work. But what you probably don't know is that it's not your fault. The foods that are just filled our grocery store right now are manufactured. They're designed like literally in labs by guys in white coats to make you crave them. And that's because as human beings, we're designed to crave three things. And that is salt, fat, and sweets. Because in nature, those are very rare, but they are crucial for our health. Sweets tells your brain that this is a safe sort of source of nutrients like fruit. Fat is this abundant source of energy coming from meat. And then salt is extremely important in regulating our water levels. So we need these things, and the food producers know this, and they are creating these, I call them Franken foods, um, to stimulate these three senses. And because they know that we there's nothing we can do about it. And our, these natural built-in cravings that we're hardwired for are way stronger than your willpower. So you can't really fight them. Um, but by the end of uh, this lecture, you're going to realize how you can overcome them. So uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the bliss point, but this is what these food manufacturers are all striving for, and they found it. This is the point at which they can maximize all of these stimulating senses to your taste buds to really drive you to eat this food, but minimize how satisfying it is. So if you, you catch that, it really drives you to eat it, but it discourages you from stop eating it. So it's like it's food with no breaks. And they found it, and they patented it, and they can sell it to other food manufacturers. So it's just it's unfair. It's unfair. This should, this should make you upset if it hasn't. Uh, and a big part of this is since they're food without breaks is how do you know when you're full if these foods aren't telling you? I mean the, the most obvious is just if your stomach swells enough that it stretches and ugh, you just feel full like you do after probably a typical Thanksgiving dinner. But that's just not a practical way to feel full after every single meal. No, no wonder uh, our Americans are overweight. But what is really supposed to happen is you, your body is supposed to send you signals to tell you that, oh, this food that you're sending down to your stomach is filled with nutrition. You can stop eating now. I always use the example of prime rib versus Oreos. If you're eating prime rib, not only does it take a little longer to chew and swallow and break that down, but once it does, your digestive tract sends signals to your brain saying, hey, we're getting tons of calories, tons of getting tons of good proteins, good fats, we're full, you can stop eating, and you'll feel full and push the plate away at a reasonable time. If you're eating Oreos, on the other hand, uh, not only is that super stimulating your, your taste buds and triggering the same type of pleasure reward centers in your brain that narcotics do, but you're not getting any nutrition. So your body thinks you're still starving. 
So it just tells you to keep on eating because it's not getting any of the nutrition it needs. So it's telling you to keep eating food. And so you, by the end, but without, before you know it, you've gone through a whole sleeve of Oreos and then you're probably feeling, feeling a little sick. But by the end of the 30 day challenge at the end of this, uh, talk, which I hope you will participate in me with, um, this is all going to change. So you'll be able to appreciate the natural flavors in real food. You, your taste buds are quick to recover, so you won't need the super stimulating Franken foods to, to enjoy what you're eating. The pleasure reward centers in your brain are not going to be tied to these sugars. They're going to be tied to actual nutrition and feeling full, and you're no longer going to be controlled by your food, which is a very empowering place to be. So number two is hormones. Like I said before, this is very important if weight loss is an important goal for you. Um, there are tons of different hormones out there. They're basically like little messengers that carry instructions from one part of the body to another. Uh, there's tons of different ones. We're only going to talk about four tonight. Uh, the first one here is insulin. You're probably familiar, at least somewhat familiar with insulin because as it re relates to diabetes. But what it is, it's a storage hormone. So if you eat food, especially sugars, and your body breaks it down, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream, you don't want all this sugar just floating around in your blood because then you'll get candy-coated organs. So that's where insulin comes in. It takes all the sugar and packs it away into cells. And when it does this, it has two choices. One, like checking how much gas you have in the tank of your car, it checks to see how much stored sugar you have. If you're, you've already topped off or close to it, it stores the rest of this fat. So again, if you're weight, wanting to lose weight, your ears should perk up here. Um, too many carbohydrates means that you're going to be storing this excess sugar as fat. What leptin does, leptin is secreted by your body fat. So if you have a lot of body fat, you'll secrete a lot of leptin. If you have a little body fat, you'll secrete just a little leptin. Um, how much body fat you have is really important because you don't want to have too little or too much. It's a, it's a Goldilocks situation. So that's where leptin comes in just to tell your brain where you're at. The problem is if you have uh, too much insulin floating around your blood, it blocks leptin signal. So your brain assumes that you're too skinny and it encourages you to keep eating. It starts sending you signals that you're hungry, even if you're not necessarily hungry because it thinks you're dangerously low on body fat. So that's obviously not a good place to be. Glucagon is the flip side to insulin. So insulin stores uh, sugars away. Glucagon releases them into your blood to be to use as fuel. So if you're interested in burning stored fat for energy, glucagon is your best friend. Uh, the problem is, if, that, if there's too much insulin in your blood, glucagon never gets released. So if you're constantly eating sugars, especially, glucagon ne is never released to do its job. This is another reason why it's important to eat three meals a day and not snack all day, because if you're constantly snacking, that's constantly releasing insulin, and glucagon never does its job. So the last one here is cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone, so it's important for a couple reasons. First off, if you're stressed, you're going to stress eat. You know, food is very emotional, and it's a comforting factor for, for a lot of us, so um, too much cortisol in your blood will encourage you to keep eating. Also, what cortisol does is it tells your brain that you're in danger. That's, that's what a stress hormone means. It's that, that they, things, you're in a fight or flight or stress response. And so when you're, when you're stressed out like this and your body thinks you're in danger, then you actually hang on to your body fat because since, this, since that's such an abundant source of energy, you, that's the last thing your body wants to release if it thinks it's in, in trouble. So you'll actually burn muscle before you'll burn fat if you are re chronically releasing cortisol. And unfortunately, for most people that have tried diets, limiting the amount of calories that you're eating or dieting is stressful to your body. Even if you don't feel it mentally, uh, your body sure does. So low-cal di diets release uh, cortisol, which means that you're burning muscle instead of fat. So that's why short-term people may lose weight on these low-calorie diets, but it's not sustainable because your body thinks you're starving and it's hanging on to its body fat. So that's why you can't lose weight on, on a typical diet. also want to make the point here that you can't out-exercise poor food choices. Uh, so you can't just you know have an extra big dessert and then go out and run on the treadmill for a while. Because while you're burning calories, which is a good thing, it's not doing anything to your hormone levels. And like I said in the beginning here, if weight loss is one of your goals, you got to get your hormones under control. And the only way to do that is to change the food on your plate. So the third one here is the guts of the matter. Uh, obviously, the main purpose of your digestive tract is to break down food and absorb it into your blood. But it's also a big part of your immune system. Most of your the functions of your immune system happen in your digestive tract. So it's very important that you have a healthy gut. 
most people don't really know what happens to food after they swallow them. Um, so we're just taking a little road trip here. And I, I promise this, uh, this uh, crazy straw here will make sense in a minute. So first off, you take a bite and you start chewing. Um, obviously, the main purpose of this is to break the big chunks into little chunks. But also, there is an enzyme in your saliva that starts to break down carbohydrates just while it's in your mouth. Then you swallow and it moves down to your stomach where the stomach acid continues to go to work, breaking things down into their smaller components. And then it releases a little bit uh, into your small intestine and like controlled amounts. In your small intestine, this is where the final breakdown happens. So proteins become amino acids, fats become fatty acids, and carbohydrates turn into sugar. So again, I want to make a quick little point here that it doesn't matter if you're eating a, a banana, a piece of bread, or a Snickers bar. All carbohydrates end up as sugars. So once things are broken down to their little bitty components, they're absorbed through the walls of your intestinal lining into your blood. The remainder then goes on to your large intestines where it pulls out all the rest of the water. And then the rest from there is, well, it's secreted out as poop, basically. So uh, the big takeaway here is that as humans, we're basically one big crazy straw. Uh, food goes down on one end, zips around through your intestines, and then comes out the back end. Food doesn't technically go into you unless it's absorbed through your intestines. So just because you eat it doesn't mean that you're absorbing it, is, is the point here. So leaky gut syndrome. This is a major problem, in, at least in our country, and most people have never heard of it. What's supposed to happen is these little bits up here, these are food. So whether or not it's broken down or it's uh, on its process of being broken down, what's supposed to happen is these little fingers here will grab it, pull it into the cells where it's checked by the immune system to see if it's cool or not. If it is, it is then released down here into the bloodstream. The problem is, is if people have inflammation in their digestive tract, you get these gaps between the cells. And then undigested food, bacteria, toxins, whatever, can just go right on through directly in your bloodstream without ever being checked by the immune system. That's bad. Uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, you've got all this junk that's now in your blood, and once it's in your blood, it can go wherever it wants. And this is a big issue with food allergies. So let's say, for example, you eat some chicken, and you broke it down, and before things are, uh, the protein is totally broken down into amino acids, you still have a tiny piece of chicken here. If you've got a gap between the cell, that little piece of chicken can go right into your bloodstream. Your immune system sees this and says, hey, well, what the heck is this, and attacks it. And it doesn't just attack it and destroy it, it also remembers it, that this was a troublemaker, and let's beat it up next time it comes into our system. So next time you go to eat chicken, your immune system up here when it's just still in your intestines, will recognize that, hey, this thing attacked us before, and they go nuts, releasing your full immune system on it and really uh, destroying it as you eat it. So this is where food allergies come from. And this is why it's such a big problem nowadays is because so many people have leaky gut, because so many people have inflammation in the digestive tract. Okay, and another big part of your uh, digestive tract is a bacteria. You may, you may or may not know that there are actually more bacteria in you than there are cells that make you. So they're a very big part of who we are, and it's important to, to know them a little bit better. So there's good guys and bad guys. Good guys I call BBFs, your best bacterial friends. They are very important. They help you break down your food. They help you absorb nutrients. They actually make vitamins for you. Uh, they work with your immune system, and they fight off the bad guys. So they're very important. And you feed them with fiber, and you can also take probiotics. The bad guys, on the other hand, these come from making the poor wrong food choices. They cause inflammation in, in your digestive tract, uh, which leads to gut permeability, so that inflammation can go throughout your whole body. And the only way to get rid of them is to starve them out, because these guys are fed by sugar. So you gotta cut the sugar out of your diet to get rid of the bad guys. Okay, and the last criteria for good food is whether or not it causes inflammation. Because inflammation, it, it sounds bad, but it's actually an important part of your immune system. So let's say like you sprain your ankle. You know how it gets like red, hot, and swollen? That's inflammation. What it's doing is it's stopping the injury and starting the repair process. That's great, except for if it goes systemic, like through your whole body, or if it's there too long, like chronic inflammation. Because what this means, that means that your immune system is maxed out all the time. So it's not going to be very good at doing its job like fighting off uh, sickness that's going around, which it's wintertime right here right now, so there's a lot of that. 
or if you've got uh, an old injury to your shoulder or something that's just not healing. Maybe you've got systemic inflammation that's preventing it from healing. Or if you've got uh, high blood pressure or clogged arteries, your immune system is supposed to be what's clearing that stuff out. So if it's not, you probably have systemic inflammation. This is also where we want to take a, a point to uh, defend your genes a little bit. Because uh, a lot of people will just blame all their problems on their genetics. Like, oh, I've got arthritis, I just got bad genes. Or I've got diabetes, that's because, you know, my parents had it or whatever. And all the genes are, they're just a set of possibilities. I like to say that your, your genes load the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger. You actually have the ability to control what genes are turned on and off. And that's through the environment which a huge component of that is inflammation, or through your diet. If you want to have your best genes expressed, you need to be in the best possible environment. If you want crappy genes expressed, you're going to live in a crappy environment. That's where that chiropractic lifestyle comes in. Eat well, move well, think well, be well adjusted. This is how you become the best possible version of yourself. All right, so let's break down the foods that make you less healthy. You know, Surprise, surprise, sugar is bad for you. Uh, it does absolutely nothing good for you. Um, there's no vitamins, minerals, or nutrients in there, that period. And um, it fails all four of our good food standards, meaning it is addictive, it screws up your hormones, uh, it causes gut permeability, and feeds inflammation. So some people say, well, that's fine. I just have artificial sweeteners. These are even worse, so definitely stay away from these. Uh, for a few reasons, um, and all the uh, the rat studies that they, they do on these, I mean, it grows tumors, it melts the brain, like literally, uh, and there's no reason to think it's not doing the same thing to people, just probably at a slower rate. Um, and if you just look at the, the numbers here, aspartame, which is equal, and stevia are 300 times sweeter than sugar, sucralose, which is Splenda, is 600 times sweeter, and saccharin, which is sweet and low, is 700 times sweeter than sugar. Think of what that's doing to your brain to be hit with such a stimulant like that. Um, I mean, it's no wonder that these things are addictive and can cause such zero, serious problems. So avoid sugar, especially these artificial sweeteners. And if, if in case you weren't, uh, weren't trusting me that sugar is bad for you, here's a little graph that shows um, our sugar intake since 1700 and how it skyrocketed over the years, right along with our obesity rate. So they're, they obviously go hand in hand. You can't, you can't deny the, the correlation. All right, so next one here is alcohol. Uh, just like sugar, this fails all four of the good food standards. It does nothing for you health-wise. It's addictive. It uh, blunts your judgment in terms of the food choices you're making and probably some other decisions, but we're not going to go into those. Uh, it screws up your hormones, causes leaky gut, and leads to inflammation. So the, the rebuttal that I usually hear on this one is, well, what about red wine? A glass of red wine is supposed to be good for you. And technically that's true, but all those studies were actually funded by the wine industry. And what they didn't tell you is to get uh, enough of the component that's in grapes to make wine healthy, you would need to drink about 80 bottles a day, So, which obviously is not practical. Uh, so if you're really concerned about this, then just eat some grapes. It's at this point why I feel I need to remind everyone that I'm not trying to ruin your life. I'm just trying to be very black and white. These foods will make you more healthy. These foods will make you less healthy. It's up to you to decide where that line is and what you want to cross off your, your list of foods or not. Um, I just want to make things very clear so you can make informed decisions. All right, so the next one is seed oils. Um, this fails number four of our good food standards, meaning, meaning it causes inflammation. Um, this comes from seed oils, vegetable oils, and the reason they're so bad is because of omega-6 fatty acids. Most people have heard of omega-3s, that's why so many people take fish oil nowadays. Uh, omega-6 is just their opposite number. It increases inflammation all over your body, and it's pretty easy to avoid if you're cooking at home. You just don't cook with seeds and vegetable oils. Where it comes tricky is restaurants like to use these. They're very cheap. Uh, you can cook at high temperatures with them, um, so it's very difficult to um, avoid them if you're eating out a lot, especially if you're having fast food. And here's just a little chart that just uh, emphasizes that last point. This this blue line here at the on the top, this is just how much seed oils have increased over the recent years. You can see they're just skyrocketing here. Um, and that's because restaurants are using them. So it's it's difficult to avoid if you're eating out. So cook at home. All right, this is when people start getting mad at me uh, when I start talking about grains. But grains fail all four of our good food standards. Uh, it turns into sugar in your body, which makes it addictive. It interferes with your hormones, causes leaky gut, and it promotes inflammation. So 
Do not eat grains of any kind. That means brains, cereals, pasta, rice, quinoa, even the gluten-free stuff. Even whole grains aren't good for you. For a couple of reasons, but first off, uh, I want you to know that you're not missing out on anything by avoiding grains. There's nothing in grains that you can also get from vegetables and fruit. Not vitamins, minerals, or even fiber. Uh, quick note on fiber, there is four times the amount of fiber in fruit than there is in grains, and there is eight times the amount of fiber in vegetables than there is in grains. So you're going to be getting more, more fiber than you ever thought possible on, on this diet. And just to uh, explain my point a little bit, I thought it'd be good to look at the anatomy of a seed. On the outside here is the bran. Uh, this is like the protective layer for, for the seed. It has some vitamins and minerals in there, and this is where the fiber comes from. The middle part, the endosperm, this is, this is like the, the sugar that uh, gives the little plant energy to grow. And the germ is the part that actually becomes the plant. So there's some antioxidants in there, vitamins, and, and some fats. So if you eat refined grains, the bran and the germ are gone, and it's just the endosperm. And they take the endosperm and they add salt, sugar, and fat to it. So if you think about what you've got now, it's basically just junk food. So refined grains are clearly bad for you. But you might be thinking, well, what about whole grains? You know, my box on Cheerios says are heart healthy, right? So they, they got to be good for me. Well, not so. That's actually not true, and I'll, I'll show you why in just a second here. It's because of phytates and gluten. Phytates, uh, you probably haven't heard of, and these are an anti-nutrient. They're in grains, and what they do is they grab hold of vitamins and minerals, and they don't let go. And since we can't absorb phytates, that means we can't absorb the vitamins and minerals that they're holding on to. So remember back to the crazy straw demonstration I did earlier, this is what I was talking about. Just because you eat it doesn't mean you absorb it. You basically end up pooping out all the good stuff in grains. And then gluten, most people have heard about this nowadays. Gluten-free foods are becoming more and more popular. But gluten is a protein that's in grains that we just can't digest. So when it gets to our stomach, it irritates our, our digestive lining and it causes inflammation, which leads to uh, gut permeability, which leads to inflammation through our whole body. So it can really cause a whole lot of problems just with this one tiny little protein. And a little side note about gluten. If you've ever put up wallpaper, the glue that they use to hold up wallpaper, wallpaper paste, is made from gluten. So the next time you go to eat some uh, bread or have some cereal or something, think about that turning into a little ball of glue and then working its way through your digestive tract. And I think you'll understand why that's not such a good decision. All right, so next up is legumes, the musical fruit. This violates number three and four of our good food standards, which means it leads to gut permeability and causes inflammation in our digestive tract and through our whole body. And the reason for this is kind of similar to uh, grains. Uh, legumes have phytates in there so we can't digest them. They hold on to anything good that was in the legumes so we don't get those vitamins and minerals. But it also causes that localized inflammation which leads to systemic inflammation. And the reason their beans are called the musical fruit is because since we can't digest them they tend to just sit in our gut and then ferment and that releases gas. So it makes, it makes us uh, antisocial because no one wants to sit next to us. Um, so avoid them. Also, people will generally come out and say, well, what about soy? Soy is a health food. And that's where I get my tofu from. Uh, tofu and soy are not health foods. They're marketed as that, but they're really not. Uh, and the reason for that is because soy contains large amounts of phytoestrogens. It's like you're taking just random amounts of the pharmaceutical estrogen. It's, it's really not a great situation. Obviously, guys, you don't want uh, estrogen floating around your blood, period. But uh, for the women out there, you don't want just random amounts of estrogen released into your bloodstream when you eat. I would assume that uh, that makes sense there. So definitely avoid this. Um, legumes may seem harmless, but they actually are doing uh, more damage than, than you might think. Oh, and if you think that you're not getting a lot of soy in your diet, um, this is where I, I kind of have to burst that bubble a little bit with uh, soybean oil. Soy is kind of like corn where they can uh, break it apart and put it, build into almost anything. It's very cheap for them to grow, so they end up adding it to a lot of our food. So if you start reading your labels, you'll see soy is in a ton of different stuff. And that's what this graph shows. Uh, over the past, uh, what was that, 40 years or so, they've really uh, mastered how they can break it down and pack it into our food because it's a cheap source of uh, calories that they're, they're putting into our, in our processed food. All right, so next... Dairy. This is, again, where people get upset with me. But uh, dairy isn't good for you, and I'll, I'll explain why. So if you think about mother's milk, whether it be a human mom to human baby or a cow mom to cow baby, it's the perfect food. It's a perfect balance of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins that that baby needs to grow. 
But it's more than just the nutrients. It's also uh, packed full of hormones because a baby does not have a very mature immune system. They also need to grow exponentially at this time in their life. A baby cow will put on hundreds of pounds in the first few months of life. So does it make sense to give this food uh, with these strong hormonal signals to an older child or an adult when it's intended for a baby? Absolutely not. And it especially doesn't make sense to give these type of uh, hormones, hormonal signals to an older child of another species. And that's not even taking into account the environment that these cows are raised in. Most of them are, in, are come from factory farms, which means they're locked into a pen where they can't even move. They just stand there all day ankle deep in their own feces. This obviously makes them very sick, so they're pumped full of antibiotics, which uh, gets passed on through the milk. And since they need to, the cows are still going to die early, they need to increase milk production, so they pump, pump them full of growth hormone so they can get their biggest bang for the dollar. Again, this growth hormone gets passed along into the milk that uh, is served in the grocery stores. But to make matters worse, you're not just getting growth hormone and antibiotics, you're also getting pus and blood. Because these cows are very sick and they're hooked onto their milking machines 24-7 and they get infected. So that pus and blood makes its way into the milk. So obviously you can't feed this pussy bloody milk to people. They would die. So what they do is they pasteurize it. This is the reason why they pasteurize food nowadays. This is basically just boiling the milk to kill off any of the bad bacteria that's in there. The bad part is, is it's also killing off anything good that might have been in there uh, that would have actually helped your health. But it, they kill it off. And then sometimes they actually will homogenize food, which is like they force the milk through these tiny little holes, which splits the cells open. So now you've got this food that has no nutritional value, uh, that the cells have been destroyed, so your body doesn't even recognize what it is, and it just kind of wreaks havoc on your digestive tract. So, but what about calcium? People always say, I need to get calcium from milk to get strong bones. This has been a very successful marketing campaign by the dairy industry. Um, dairy is actually not a very good source of calcium, but even if it was, the United States has one of the highest rates of osteoporosis in the world, even though we have one of the highest calcium intake rates in the world. So we need a lot more than calcium to make strong bones. You need vitamins C, D, and K, magnesium, phosphorus, among others. Uh, but the biggest thing is you just got to pick up something heavy. Even if you're giving your, your body all the building blocks it needs, it's not just going to decide to make stronger bones you have to give it a reason which means you have to put a stress on your bones for them to be like oh we need to make our bones stronger so let's do that so exercise is very important and that's not just running on the treadmill that's actually picking up some weight and um to uh to build your bones stronger that way all right so this all adds up you may be thinking okay so i have you know one or two of those things today what's the big deal well think about the food that you ate today Think about how much of it violated one or all of our good food standards. And think about you eating that way every day for the past week or month or year or decades. And think about how that adds up in your body. This is it has a cumulative effect. But the good news is you can undo it pretty quickly. And you can really hit the reset button. And that's what this 30-day challenge that I'm going to introduce at the end is all about. So you might be wondering, all right, Doc, that's great, but what the heck am I supposed to eat now? Well, I'll tell you, eat real food, meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, fruit, healthy oils, nuts, and seeds. Choose foods that were raised, fed, and grown naturally, and foods that are nutrient-dense with lots of naturally occurring vitamins and minerals. This is not a diet. You're going to eat as much as you need to maintain strength, energy, activity levels, and a healthy body weight. Aim for well-balanced nutrition, which means eating animals and a significant amount of plants. Eating like this will help you look, feel, live, and perform your best, and reduce your risk for a variety of lifestyle-related diseases and conditions. There it is. 30 seconds is all you need to know about food. But I'm going to break it down a little bit more. But uh, in a nutshell, that's all we're going to cover tonight. Protein. This comes from meat, seafood, and eggs. Focus here first. When I, what I mean by that is every time you build a meal or a snack, focus on the protein first. I also mean if you have to um, decide where you're going to spend your budget when it comes to grocery shopping, focus on the protein first. Protein forms your skin, hair, tendons, ligaments, muscles, hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, and antibodies. So it does a ton. It literally makes who you are. And besides from this, it's also the most satisfying of all the, of all the nutrients. So if you're hungry, eat some protein. That's going to be the most satisfying. So when I talk about food quality, this is where things can get a little confusing because you'll start seeing the labels will have natural plastic all over them. This really doesn't mean anything. This is a marketing thing. 
Uh, so you really kind of have to get a little savvy when it comes to reading labels. Um, I'm a big fan of buying meat from a local farm called Walnut Acres. If you're in the uh, Chicago suburbs, take a look at them. Their website is walnut for meat That's the number four, dot com. Uh, we're a big fan of them. We've used them for years, uh, but we know the farm. We know how they raise their animals, and um, it's healthy. We, we trust them. But here's a quick little video on what exactly we're talking about when it comes to food quality. The way we eat has changed more in the last 50 years than in the previous 10,000. The modern supermarket has, on average, 47,000 products. The industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating, because if you knew, you might not want to eat it. We've never had food companies this powerful in our history. Everything we've done in modern agriculture is to grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper. If you could grow a chicken in 49 days, why would you want one you got to grow in three months? When you go through the supermarket, there is an illusion of so much of our industrial food turns out to be rearrangements of corn. Sometimes you look at a vegetable and say, okay, well, we can get two hamburgers for the same price. They have managed to make it against the law to criticize their products. There is an effort to make it illegal to publish a photo of any industrial food operation. I find it incredible that the FDA wants to allow the sale of meat from cloned animals without any labeling. Peanut butter contaminated with salmonella. E. coli has been found in spinach, apple juice. Smells like money to me. The average consumer does not feel very powerful. It's the exact opposite. When we run an item past the supermarket scanner, we're voting for local or not, organic or not. Look at the tobacco industry. The battle against tobacco is a perfect model of how an industry's irresponsible behavior can be changed. Imagine what it would be if, as a national policy, the idea would be to have such nutritionally dense food that people actually felt better, had more energy, and weren't sick as much. You know, now, now, see, that's a noble goal. People have got to start demanding good, wholesome food of us, and we'll deliver, I promise you. The farmer at the end of that is actually the farmer who now supplies all of the pork to Chipotle. Chipotle is one of those companies that is really kind of leading the charge and the move towards responsible um, sourcing of their food. Uh, because they do raise their animals right at that farm, and uh, I'm glad to see that some companies are, are are changing because we really do have a lot of power as consumers, like they're saying in that video. I love the line about how every time you scan food at the grocery store, you're voting. Uh, it's very empowering, and we really do have a lot of power as consumers. So um, think about that. The next time you're at the grocery store or any store, it's just the food that you buy, the products that you buy, is you voting for the kind of world that you want you and your kids living in. So... Food Inc. is a great movie. I encourage you to check it out. Okay, so this is the part where uh, once I start bringing up eggs, there's always somebody who's a little worried about cholesterol, so I want to clear its name, so to speak. Uh, cholesterol is not a bad thing. It's in every cell in your body. It insulates neurons. It builds and maintains cell membranes and helps you break down the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and it also makes hormones for you. So there's this myth out there that eating cholesterol means you're going to have high cholesterol levels. This isn't true. What is really happening is most of the cholesterol that's in your body, 85% of it, your body makes for a reason. Only 15% of it comes from your diet. So if your doctor tells you that you have high cholesterol and you should lower it, I mean, does it make more sense to chip away at that 15% from your diet or that 85% that your body's making? If you want to deal with the 85% that your body's making, it's, it's making it for two reasons. One is you have systemic inflammation because cholesterol helps your, helps soothe inflammation in your body. And two is stress. Remember earlier when I was talking about hormones and I brought up the stress hormone cortisol? In order for your body to make cortisol, you have to start with cholesterol. It's just the building blocks of cortisol. So your body will make cholesterol in response for the demand for the stress hormone cortisol. So if you want to decrease your, uh, your body's amount of cholesterol, you need to do two things. Decrease the inflammation in your body, which you can do by changing the food on your plate, and decreasing the amount of stress, which you can do by changing the food on your plate. So let's make some changes here. All right, vegetables and fruit. 
I don't know if you guys knew this, but vegetables are good for you. My, my doctor's really paying off, right, with that kind of knowledge. Uh, but veggies are very important. A lot of people will avoid them for whatever reason, but, I mean, if you don't like them, it's kind of like too bad. You can't be healthy without them. Uh, you know, we're all adults. We, we mow our lawns. We pay our bills. We eat our veggies. It's just, it's just part of life. And I don't care if they're fresh, frozen, cooked, or raw. Whatever you got to do, just get them in your mouth. And I found from talking to people that there's three real reasons that people avoid vegetables. One is just you're so used to these overstimulating franken foods that I was talking about earlier that your taste buds just can't appreciate the good flavors in these veggies. The good news is your taste buds recover very quickly once you eliminate those foods from your diet and you'll start to appreciate uh, the deliciousness that is in um, all these green veggies. Or two, uh, you're in a veggie rut, so you just, you're a peas and carrots kind of person. There's a whole plethora of veggies out there at any grocery store that are delicious, and you just need to try something new. I always encourage people to, every time they go to the grocery store, get one new vegetable that you haven't had before, and when you get home, get on the Google machine and look up a tasty way to cook it. And the third one is, is maybe your your mom force-fed you canned lima beans and, and made you sit at the table until you finished them when you were growing up. Uh, the good news is we're all adults now, so we get to choose the veggies that we eat and how we cook them. Uh, so get back in, in the game, uh, look up some recipes, I'll send you some, and uh, there's a lot of really delicious ways to get the vegetables in you. But uh, Fruit's good too, but vegetables are mandatory, fruit is optional. Okay, uh, when it comes to produce, this is when people really start thinking about organics. But just a quick reminder, protein is the most important thing. So when you're thinking of food quality, focus there first. If you're able to get good organic meats and you still want to get organic produce, that's awesome. Uh, but remember, keep the protein first. Good rule of thumb when it comes to organic produce is if it has a rind on it, like an avocado, then don't, don't worry about getting organic. If you're going to eat the rind like an apple, then it is a good idea to get it organic. And this is a quick reference to a study here of why this is important. Uh, a recent study that they did in the uh, Journal of Pediatrics looked at the urine from a thousand kids and found that the ones that had the highest concentrations of pesticides were the ones that had ADHD. So like we said before, food does matter. This stuff absolutely influences what's going on in your body. And um, But most people don't really understand what organic means. So I want to play a quick little video that explains that for you. So you're at the store and you're looking for something mm -hmm. quick and easy to eat, mm -hmm. but you're also trying to be health conscious. Mm -hmm. So instead of the regular Cheesy Mac, you go for the organic okay. stuff. Instead of regular chicken nuggets, you grab some organic chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. Then top it off with some organic sandwich yeah. cookies. Mmm, cookies. It's all organic, so it's good for you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not always. Huh? You see, while 45% of Americans think the organic label means healthy or good, organic really has nothing to do with how nutritious the food is for you. Organic really just defines how the ingredients were created, prepared, or raised. Let me explain. Organic means that there aren't any genetically modified ingredients. Also, organic means that no chemicals were used to kill bugs and weeds, and that all pesticides are natural instead of synthetic. And organic means nothing was fertilized with sewage sludge. Yeah, sewage sludge. Organic also means that nothing was exposed to radiation, which some manufacturers do to sterilize food, and that no industrial solvents were used to clean things up. Also, organic means there could be no chemical food additives that some foods have to make them stay fresh for an unnatural amount of time. And if it's meat, that there's no routine use of antibiotics or hormones pumped into the animals. And all this stuff is really important. No. But notice, organic doesn't necessarily mean that the ingredients are nutritious. So if you care about healthy foods, it's more important to just eat whole foods, mostly fruits and vegetables, and avoid packaged-like substances. And yeah, that includes organic Cheesy Mac. And here's a really big tip. If you can pronounce all the ingredients in a package you're holding, then you're on the right track. All right, and the last food category I want to talk about is fats. Fats is the one uh, that's really misunderstood, and this is kind of where a lot of people can derail when it comes to this uh, whole food way of eating um, because fat's gotten a bad name. But to defend it here a little bit, uh, we're looking at the brain is over two-thirds fat. All of your hormones are made from fat. 
on the outside of every cell in your body, there's a little soap bubble uh, made from fat that protects your cells. It's an excellent source of energy, makes you feel full, and it makes food tastier. And you need it for calories. If you're getting rid of all the processed foods in your diet, those are really dense with uh, calories, mostly from carbohydrate. And if you cut those out of your diet, that leaves a huge calorie deficit. And that will put you into this low-calorie, stressed-out starvation mode, which we don't want. So you have to replace some of those calories, and you're going to get those from fat. So fat keeps our skin healthy. It enhances our immune system, stabilizes blood sugar, benefits your heart, normalizes cholesterol, and even prevents cancer. So fat, fat is very important. It's gotten a bad rap. Uh, i got a little video here I want to play for you. This is a documentary that's coming out on the importance of fat, and I think it really uh, answers a lot of questions. I'm responsible for writing all this, and I don't believe it anymore. When my dad gets sick, surprised us all. Ex-sportsman, lean, fit, healthy, never drank, boom, heart attack. I wanted to know why that happened. What I found shocked me. The average consumer is eating less uh, fat in their diet. They are eating more carbohydrate in the diet and we've got rampant increases in obesity, diabetes, heart disease. I found out that a lot of what I thought I knew was what you can only describe as lies. I've always been very cynical about diets. For 28 days I'm going to completely disregard the food pyramid. I'm going to gorge on fat. That's good. That's good. We've been lied to about cholesterol for long. Some people don't understand how it works. It's this magic in fat. In my view, the prudent diet does not prevent heart disease. It causes it. And certainly it contributes to diabetes and obesity in a major way. I'm controlling my diabetes without treatment. Meat, fish, nuts, eggs, those in my view should be the core food. We're going to prove that fat is good. I feel a lot better. I've lost a lot of weight during time without even trying. My favourite is um, a steak with nice pieces of fat on it. And uh, I'm quite confident in 10 years time that uh, the Western society will be embracing this uh, low carb, high fat concept. I'm just going to try and get to the bottom of how I can drop dead healthy. Just don't fear fat. Don't fear fat. Great message there. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of these food documentaries. Um, you can find most of them on Netflix, if not there, iTunes, Amazon. If you're a patient at our office, we have most of them here in the lending library. You can borrow them for free. But I encourage you guys to check those out. Uh, but I just want to show you this graph. This is when they made the low-fat guidelines that are in the food pyramid. And there's no coincidence that it just correlated with the dramatic rise in obesity. Uh, so again, don't fear fat. All right, so let's eat. That's how, how do we put together meals? For one thing, you're not going to be weighing and measuring your food. You're not going to count calories, grams, ounces, blocks, or points. Food is supposed to be just a natural, instinctual, joyful thing. Um, so as you're going through this uh, challenge, don't just change the food that you're eating. Change the way you eat it too. This is a great opportunity to develop good food habits. Starting with three meals a day, beginning with breakfast. Breakfast being the most important meal of the day, that's not just a saying, that's absolutely true. And uh, avoid snacking if you can help it. Remember back in the beginning when I was talking about uh, glucagon, what, getting that insulin or that, uh, that hormone secreted so you can start burning fat for fuel? That's very important in, term, in um, not snacking. You need those periods where you're not consuming food for your body to go into a little bit of a fasting state and that way it will start getting energy uh, from your own body as opposed to relying on food that you're, that you're eating. And also stop eating a few hours before bedtime for the same reason, so you can get into that fasting state while you're sleeping. But also there's a lot of like really complicated things that are happening to your body while you're sleeping. Um, and if you've got freshly food that you just put down in your stomach, uh, it can make that a lot more difficult and you're not going to get as good night's sleep. All right, so protein. Um, again, this is the, the cornerstone of, of your diet now. Is if you're going to center each meal and snack around your protein. Um, I'm giving you guys some basic guidelines of how much you should eat. Uh, in reality, in, in the real life, you should just be able to listen to your body and eat based on what your body's telling you. 
But if you had bad food habits leading up till now, you're, you can't really rely on what your hormones are telling you. So I'm going to give you some basic ideas, but just know that uh, you're going to be playing around with this as you go forward. But as far as protein goes, you're looking at about the size of your palm. One to two palm-sized servings of protein with each meal. This is just a guideline, so if it's like eggs, it's about a handful. And if it's like a funny-shaped food like uh, uh, tuna from a can, you just guesstimate. Um, like I don't want to hear about any of you guys playing shrimp Tetris trying to figure out exactly what is a palm size serving of uh, shrimp. Um, but again, here you want to get as high quality meat, seafood, and eggs as possible. Uh, but don't skip on your protein. Getting enough protein is kind of the, the key to this whole thing. All right, veggies. Fill the rest of your plate with veggies. And that's, that's pretty much all the instructions you need there. Uh, like I said before, variety and spices will help keep it interesting, help keeping you uh, engaged and looking forward to your veggies. Um, like I said, once your taste buds uh, acclimate to this new way of eating, uh, you're going to really appreciate them and even look forward to them in your meals. Fruit. Uh, just one to two servings a day, about the size of your fist. So like, you know, an apple or an orange would be the right size. Um, big thing here is no smoothies. I know uh, fruity, smoothies sound like they're uh, healthy and uh, it can be kind of the go-to food that people go to if they're in a hurry in the morning. But they're really not an ideal way to eat for a couple of reasons. First off, uh, you're going to be getting a lot of fruit if you make a smoothie. There's no way you're going to get just one serving size uh, from a smoothie. And two, since you're blending it and crunching all that food down into just like a just a little bits, uh, it just kind of flies through your digestive system. So even though it's coming from a healthy source, fruit, you're still going to get that big sugar spike and the insulin spike and that crash afterwards. So you're going to lose a lot of energy from it. Um, since it's a lot of sugar all at once, your body's going to store that as fat. And if you're just the kind of person that's kind of sensitive to sugar, like you know that's your your stumbling block, then sometimes people will use fruit to prop up that uh, sugar addiction. And I want you guys to avoid that. So like I said before, veggies are mandatory. Fruit is optional. And fats. This is the one you're going to be playing around the most with. Uh, I gave you some basic guidelines here. If it's a liquid fat, like an oil or butter, it's about the size of your thumb. So that's like, what, one to two tablespoons? Uh, nuts and seeds, about the size of a closed fist. Olives and uh, coconut flakes, be an open open fist. Um, you can add more. Have Feel free to if, increase this, but don't go any less than this. When I hear people that switch to this way of eating and they're telling me that they're hungry all the time, I can almost guarantee that they're avoiding fats. Uh, just because that stigma that our society has about fat. But uh, I hope you've learned throughout this presentation that eating fat does not make you fat and that it's an essential part of our diet. All right, so this is just a reminder that as you go through this, um, you're going to need to change this up a little bit. Uh, if you're a big tough guy that crossfits all the time, you're going to need to eat more. Maybe at, at a fourth meal at the same serving sizes that I recommended before. Or maybe you just need to increase the amount of protein and fat that you're eating. Uh, if you're a little person who just has a, a desk job and you're not very active, then you can stay on the smallest side of things. But the, the point is you have to tailor this to you. All right, so the challenge that I was talking about, this is when you're hitting the reset button on your body. So you, you go for a full 30 days of being very strict with all the food guidelines that I outlined. That means eating meat, seafood, eggs, lots of veggies, some fruit, and plenty of healthy fats, and avoiding sugar, alcohol, grains, legumes, and dairy. This is a very strict way of eating, and it can be difficult to do long-term. That's why this is a 30-day challenge. I don't expect anyone to land here and eat this way for the rest of your life. That would just be no fun. Um, there are, but The point is to hit a reset button to make sure that you know what your body can handle and what it can't. You want to know how your body is reacting to these different foods so you can make an informed decision whether or not you want it in your body. So don't attempt to try to recreate junk foods like uh, paleo pizza or paleo pancakes, things like that. Um, because even though if you're using healthy ingredients, it's still encouraging those bad food habits. And uh, they're not going to be as good as a real thing. So just leave them out for the 30-day for the challenge. And also, don't step on the scale. The scale is a very, very poor indicator of your health. Um, like when I first made my dietary changes, uh, I didn't gain or lose a pound. I stayed exactly the same. But my body composition changed dramatically. I wasn't like a, a overweight. I wasn't like fat. But I was just soft or squishy, if you will. And uh, as I w made these dietary changes, again, my, the weight didn't change. But I put on a ton of muscle and burned a ton of fat. And so I looked and felt completely different. But according to the scale, it was it was a failure. So um, 
for the 30 days at least, stay off of it and just pay attention to more of how you look, how you feel, and how your clothes are fitting. All right, so getting started, uh, just look at your calendar, pick out 30 days, and just commit to it. Get your family and friends on board. It's so much easier if you're doing this with a buddy. Um, and what my wife and I do, to, which makes things a lot easier, is once a week we just pick out the meals that we're going to have for that full week. And we just write down the grocery list and go shopping, buy all of it. And then we, in one afternoon we'll cut up all the veggies and fruit or whatever we need to get the food ready. It only takes like an hour or two to do that. But then for the rest of the week, you have zero prep time for your cooking. So it really takes a lot of the excuses out uh, of uh, staying home and cooking if the food is already pretty much ready to go. And it just makes your life a whole lot easier. All right, so when, when you get this underway, uh, the first week can be a little bit rough, uh, especially for people that are really carb dominant. Uh, you'll, get, uh, feel, you'll feel fatigued. Uh, you might get a headache. Uh, get a little, might get a little grouchy. It's what we call the carb flu. Um, second week, that'll go away. You'll start feeling a little bit better, but you might still have some distress in your digestive system. Uh, this is most likely from the increase in fiber. Like I was saying before, how much more fiber fruits and veggies have than uh, the processed foods. Um, so you, your stomach might be having a little trouble dealing with that. So just make sure you're consuming lots of water to help you with the fiber, and but it'll pass. The second half of the challenge, that's when you really start seeing the, the miracles happen. And how much of that and when you see it is really dependent on where you're starting from, how, how significant your health challenges were. But uh, this is when you really start seeing some, some cool stuff happening. All right. So like I said before, the whole point of this was to hit the reset button. So moving forward, you can be as lenient as you want. You're going to define what good eating is for you. But for these 30 days, really be strict. And I like to use the analogy of cat math for this. Let's say you're allergic to cats and you've got 10 cats at home and you just feel awful because you're allergic to them. So you get rid of nine of them, but you hang on to your favorite one. You're still going to feel awful. Maybe a little bit better, maybe, but you're still going to feel pretty bad because you need to get rid of all of them in order to take care of that problem. So that's what I'm talking about with these, this 30-day challenge. You have to get rid of everything in order for it to work. I don't want you to cut out just milk or just grains or whatever and expect to see significant results. You really have to get rid of everything. Give it 30 days. It's just 30 days. Anyone can do this for 30 days. And then once that's over, you can start reintroducing these foods and see which ones are problematic for you. And then you'd be coming at this from an educated perspective on what works for you. So I hope this was informative. You probably have questions. Uh, so please feel free to seek me out, uh, whether or not you're local or if you're uh, from elsewhere in the country or the world. You can find my contact information at www.hansonfamilychiro.com. That's my, uh, my chiropractic office's main website. Or you can reach me directly by emailing me at drdave at hansonfamilychiro.com. I hope this was helpful. Please feel free to share with your family and friends. Uh, get on board and make these changes, and we can uh, really build a better you. Thank you very much.